This week we're talking about the next step at the end of active listening where we transition into a more response-oriented um, stance. So active listening is primarily related to the other's frame of reference. That means that we, the listener, are taking on the other's perspective the best we can <clears throat> by using the steps or the techniques of active listening. And <clears throat> the final step of active listening takes a swing and it shifts to the self's frame of reference. That means you, the listener, become um, the speaker. And that means that you're bringing your own thoughts and opinions into the conversation more directly than you would during active listening. So just to review, active listening involves paying attention, demonstrating that attention, deferring judgment, providing feedback, and then finally, what we're getting to today, responding appropriately. <clears throat> I want to highlight that the mindfulness facet that we've covered, the, one of the mindfulness facets that we talked about, uh, namely acting with awareness or aware acting, is one that might primarily find its place nestled into this responding appropriately step. So using the facets of mindfulness or the skills of mindfulness to kind of keep a check on ourselves, to observe and describe to ourselves what's going on in our own experience, and to prevent ourselves from being overly judgmental or reactive will do, a really, will do us a real service in listening, and especially active listening. And then when we take the step to begin to make responses, acting with awareness will be really, really important. That means avoiding aut um, automatic responses, uh, kind of stock answers we might have. That av avoids um, thinking that we have the answers before we've made a proper and thorough exchange with the person, and so on. <coughs> Today we're going to go over what I think of as from uh, levels of emphasis in responding appropriately, moving from a softer level of emphasis where we're a little, um, uh, we don't use quite as much force in our response, all the way to a slightly stronger response. So um, reassurance and um, encouragement, suggestion, advice, and urging are those levels that we're going to go through. And this is just one way to think about responding appropriately. There's you know, infinite ways to respond to people that might or might not be appropriate. These are just some ideas or some principles to guide you as you go along. With encouragement and reassurance, you're saying what you think um, and what you believe. You're no longer just the listener. You're, an active ex you're actively expressing your own uh, stance. And the way that you might use encouragement to do that is to basically... Um, highlight the, the degree of capability and competence that you think that the child or the family or whoever you're talking to has in dealing with their own life circumstances. Um, this is, along with all of these levels of emphasis, um, authenticity is very, very important. Don't say things that you don't really mean. Um, if you feel, if you don't think that a, a person is um, handling a certain situation or a certain part of their lives very skillfully, don't say that you think they are. Find something else that you genuinely think is working well, or at least they have good intention with, and point that out to them. <clears throat> um, if a person is, um, for instance, trying really hard to uh, figure things out or or even if they're trying in the wrong direction, say, being able to point out to them that, uh, for instance, I appreciate how much you're really trying or the, how much effort you're putting into trying to solve this problem. That would be an example of encouragement or reassurance. Throughout these levels, I'm giving you kind of like starter scripts. So the three that I've given you with this level are, um, I appreciate the way you, that's kind of like the example I just gave, Another is, I like that you, I like that you did this, I like that this is how you handled it, and I admire how you. These are all I statements. I feel this way about what I just saw or heard you do. Um, that can be reassuring because it 
is more direct than simply restating or reflecting. Um, uh, in an active listening stance, you might say something like, I noticed that you did this. That's not a qualitative statement. You're not saying whether or not you agreed with it or thought it was good or bad or positive or negative. Uh, but when, in this case, you're actually pointing out something that you think they're doing well. All right, the next, uh, next level, slightly more emphasis, stronger emphasis, would be suggestion. <clears throat> suggestion could be thought of as a kind of beginning movement toward um, more actively putting yourself in the conversation, more actively expressing your own um, frame of reference. So one, one good way to get into that is something that could be thought of as the problem-solving model. It's a somewhat softer way to, to uh, guide a person toward what you think they should do or what you think, how you think they might look at a situation. And one popular or good formula to go through a problem-solving model with someone is by asking a series of questions, namely asking what they've tried, given a certain problem scenario, what happened when they tried that, Ask them what they've thought of to try or what they'd like to try but haven't yet. Ask them what they think they would what would they think would happen if they did try that. And then frame it at the end by saying something like, Okay, we've talked about this option and this option. Which one do you want to try? It's a little bit of a nudge. Um, it's a, a more hands on approach to problem solving that you can help someone get into a solution that they find themselves, but uh, is heavily guided by you. Um, so s with suggestion, some examples of some starter scripts would be, this is basically like mild or soft advice. Um, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if you did this. Um, person's having trouble <clears throat> in their job and uh, they, s they are struggling with a scheduling issue or something like that. You might say, oh, I wonder if what would happen if you reached out to one of the other people who work in a different shift and asked about them switching with you, something like that. It's a, not a really firm push, but does open up options for alternatives. Um, another uh, example of suggestion is, have you thought to try some idea that you might like? <coughs> in that example, have you thought to try calling your boss about uh, rescheduling uh, uh, your your work schedule a few weeks out so that you can stay on top of, of it a little bit more and feel better about it. Now that's kind of a soft advice or mild advice. The next level of strength in this way of thinking about it is, is directly advice. So you're saying, I think you should do this, or if I were you, this is what I would do. It's much more direct. There's no soft edges around it, um, but it's also not pushy. Okay, you're not trying to get them to do anything. You're simply stating your opinion about what honestly and directly you think they should do next. This can be helpful when a person, um, especially if a person really has trouble finding their footing in a certain situation, and especially important in scenarios where um, there might be more risk involved, for instance. If you're working with a child and their parents um, might not be following through on some interventions that the physical therapist suggests for the child or something. And those parents come to you and say, I'm not sure why, you know, I'm frustrated because, or I'm worried about the fact that my child's not developing in this way physically. Your response might be thinking to yourself, okay, I've watched you ignore the physical therapist's suggestions for a long time. But what you might say is, I think you should stick a little closer to the physical therapist recommendations and see what happens. Um, or if I were you, those exercises that the physical therapist suggests, they seem like really good ideas to stay on top of. I think I would follow them if I were you. <clears throat> um, it can feel a little more af um, uh, forward and can feel uh, more confrontational sometimes. So you have to use it with kind of skill as, as with all of these because you're putting yourself and your opinion and your thoughts out there a little bit more directly. The final l level of emphasis that I'm going to describe today, and again these are just different ways of, of talking about things, not the only way of thinking about it, but um, the last one that we're going to talk about is urging. 
Now, urging is something I encourage people to use pretty discerningly. That means be really careful about when you urge someone strongly um, in your professional setting. The reasons for that uh, include the fact that if you're urging someone in a professional setting to do something, they do it, and they don't like the results, you are partially liable, at least in their eyes. It might not be true legally, but um, that is true in your relationship with them. <clears throat> so a step beyond or a step stronger than, than advice directly states, I strongly encourage you to do this, say this, follow this course of action, um, or more directly, this is what you need to do. It's very affirming or affirmative. It's very direct. It's very pointed. Um, and uh, it's a way to be able to hook into an important situation or a risky situation or one with um, some degree of potential harm, for instance. And, uh, and nudge someone along a little bit more fervently. Uh, again, those are things, that's uh, an approach you should use discerningly, but it's especially helpful in cases where, say, a child's well-being or physical harm are on the line, for instance, okay? So those are some examples of different levels <clears throat> of emphasis with... Um, responding appropriately and some of your assignment will involve experimenting with some of these things and we'll, we're going to come back to this later in the semester as well as we get to our communication experiments. I do want to make a note on conversational questions. Um, what we've talked about so far, uh, active listening and then today the responding appropriately portion of that, the other's frame of reference and self's frame of reference, we haven't talked about questions a lot. A lot of what we've talked about has have involved statements with some supportive questions. In general, I think there are some ideas about uh, formulating questions that can best facilitate conversations, especially in a professional setting, but in relationships in general. When asking people questions, when trying to figure out more information, when trying to guide them in a certain direction, it's often useful to state one question at a time. Um, there might be other reasons why you would barrage a person with questions, but that might not be the typical way to go about it. That question or those questions in the sequence should be um, succinct. That means don't ramble on about uh, what the question, what you're trying to ask them, and should be pretty clearly understandable. Um, most of the time, direct questions are preferred. Um, are, excuse me, indirect questions are preferred when you're in a conversation with uh, someone in a professional setting. That basically just leaves space for them to um, fill in details that you might not even know that they have. And that relates to open and closed-ended questions too. If I asked you, what's your name? You would give me a one-word response or two-word response or something. That's a closed question. That means you respond to me and that's it. There's no um, you give me the information I directly asked for, and that's as far as the um, exchange goes. An example of a, an open question might be something like, where did your name come from? So I didn't ask you um, something that could likely be answered by one s short, specific kind of response. <coughs> now, people who don't want to talk to you, are really good at closing questions off. So, where did your name come from? Could be um, an engaged and interested answer about my heritage and my um, ancestry and my family traditions and things like that. Or it could be my mom named me that, <laughs> right? So there's, there's always a way to shut down the question and close it. But your job as the... Um, uh, as the one asking it, is to allow it to be as open as possible for the person to make their own, to give you an answer that's more authentic to them. Um, why questions are very useful sometimes. Um, problem solving, troubleshooting, why questions are kind of essential. In relationship building conversations, why, converse, why questions can feel accusational. That's just something to, to 
that's worth noting, especially with children. A child does something that's, you know, potentially disruptive or destructive. Something, a toy breaks while they're playing with it somehow, and it looks like they did it on purpose. Why did you do that? That's a pretty natural response to within the adult's mind. How did that happen? Why did they even break that? So <clears throat> that might be what we naturally lead with, but other alternatives of that, for instance, what happened or uh, what led to that being broken? Or I noticed that's broken. Can you tell me how that happened? <clears throat> it's a little different than why did you do that? <clears throat> why is a point, right? And we might not always want to point with our questions like that. <clears throat> Another important part uh, to conversational questions involves leaving enough space for the person to answer. Not something we often think about, but is um, <clears throat> along with asking single, succinct questions, um, making it as clear as possible, and then giving the appropriate space for them to answer. I like the phrase big, small talk because, <clears throat> especially with children and adolescents, Sometimes it's hard to get something out of them, but, poten but potentially parents or other adults do. You can have a kind of back pocket um, list of things that are kind of like icebreakers or conversation starters. You can come up with your own too, but some that um, I've found useful begin with, tell me about. Tell me about a time when you felt stressed. Tell me about what's going on in this area of your life. Tell me about how your week was, things like that. Um, another more, slightly more penetrative one is, uh, tell me what does it mean to you to feel? And this is a little bit more of a very, of a getting to know you with, uh, with children especially. Um, what does it mean to you to feel sad? What does it mean for you to feel comfortable? Or what does it mean for you to feel safe? Those are things that are wide open questions uh, or wide open prompts, but um, and can also lead to knowing a child pretty a lot more deeply. Um, another starter is, in what ways are you? That could be something like, in what ways are you uh, like your mom? In what ways are you glad that you live here? Things like that. Um, okay, I want to make a quick note also on what's called prosody. Prosody uh, refers to an intonated way of speaking. <clears throat> this is um, as opposed to a monotone voice, um, and the irony uh, does not, uh, I, and the irony is not overlooked at my having a somewhat monotone voice and bringing this out. But it's important to realize that prosody, <clears throat> which can be a fairly sing songy kind of sound, some people, especially those in early childhood, tend to naturally have a very, very expressive and um, uh, intonated voice where there's lots of frequency change. So the voice goes up, up and down. It keeps children's attention, especially if you were to think about reading a children's book out loud. You might uh, emphasize certain voices, change your voice, raise and lower for effect, things like that. <clears throat> That's exam an example of what we mean by prosody. Prosodic speech happens to also be tied into our nervous system. <clears throat> there are ways to authentically do this with your unique personal voice so that you don't feel false or fake or you don't sound false or fake. Um, there are ways that you can find what, how your voice sounds most naturally open and warm and, um, and soothing or safe. <clears throat> and use that with children or anyone else. But the way that um, prosody or prosodic speech is tied to our nervous system happens to relate to uh, something we've mentioned a little bit before, which is the polyvagal theory. I'm not going to go into it a <clears throat> in a large detail, but I just wanted to point out that the use of prosodic language or prosodic speech happens to increase the chance or the possibility that the uh, upper branch of the vagal nerve will be stimulated, which means that the person will more naturally feel a kind of settledness and a safety in their environment with other people. It'll activate what's called the social engagement system. And uh, the reason that that's significant, or the way that that happens, is that um, <clears throat> the 
part of the vagal nerve that controls the social engagement system happens to control the ocular muscles, that's the muscles that control the eyes and not muscles around the eyes, and also the middle ear muscles, which filter out certain frequencies of sound. <clears throat> when we're in a fight-flight state, we filter out the human voice frequency, the kind of middle range, smaller or middle range voice uh, frequency. And we hear more of the low rumbling background noise, which is a sign of threat to our nervous system. So when we're helping people activate the social engagement system by using our voice in a kind of warm and peaceful way, we're helping them tune into the social engagement system by letting them hear the human voice more readily. <clears throat> so it's a little bit of a way to kind of hack into people's nervous systems in a pretty unique and beneficial way, especially with children, thinking about like that reading a storybook out loud idea. Um, all right, <clears throat> a couple of quick things on written communication. <clears throat> Briefly, purpose, audience, clarity, and convention are three cat four categories that we talked about um, a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> I want you to keep those things in mind as we uh, go through this week and, <coughs> and describe ways of providing written communication. You have to know why you're writing and you have to know to whom you're writing. You have to make it sure it's as clear as possible without a lot of extra baggage and wordiness. <clears throat> and you should choose intentionally your level of conventional use. So if it's an informal, quick written, handwritten letter, that's fine. If it's a formal document and should be, uh, word choice should be uh, selected with professionalism in mind, then you should be aware of that and, and follow through with that. <clears throat> in the case of paper uh, communication, and that's one type, the other we're going to talk about is electronic. Um, it's useful to provide yourself with a kind of preset but personalizable template to use. Kind of having, you know, just saved on your computer or something, <clears throat> a steady or a consistent format that you use, and then putting in personalized pieces of information that prevents you from having to write the whole thing every time for each child for each family it allows you to provide written communication more consistently and to do it with more ease <clears throat> now with electronic communication there are a few different ways that might look so there are ways to maintain public access or not totally public access but um, but online or internet-based post forums, so like grading centers and things like that, or parent, um, parent forums, things like that. And uh, those are really useful and helpful because you, a lot of people might be able to see it at one time. Um, the difficulty with that is that it's live, a live document. That means that <clears throat> um, if it's not updated, then it's reflecting uh, outdated information. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind, in addition to the fact that any time you're dealing with internet usage, appropriateness and permission come up. Um, using uh, or posting appropriate types of information, links, websites, things like that, you have to be really careful about. And if you put any information about students, particularly things like pictures or videos, you have to have written permission to do that from their guardians or parents. Um, email and text not everyone will end up using text messages with families of parents that they of children they work with, but some might, uh, given the appropriate boundaries. <clears throat> I would just say for those two areas, uh, email and text, treat them like their public communication. Treat them as though um, others can read them, because technically they can. Email and uh, text, unless there are firewall uh, procedures put into place and even then it's not uh, foolproof um, they're, they're basically open uh, open means of communication so treat it as though other people can read it um, <clears throat> so there are different ways to think about when or what you might write 
to communicate. There, I think of it as kind of posting on a site where others can see it is most open. Uh, email text is open, but less so. Sending a written letter, calling, and then parent conference or family conference kind of get more and more and more confidential. <clears throat> um, so there are different circumstances that might require more privacy or confidentiality, and you'll have to choose which mode of communication you use based on the content of what you're discussing. Okay, so that's a big wide open topic, and I'm not going to uh, uh, give you specific guidelines about that because every situation will be different. I would say to utilize peers and colleagues to help you make those choices. Um, okay, so uh, there are a few ways that, <clears throat> a few purposes or types of written communication, and I just wanted to bring them up to mention the fact that there's a diverse array of why we write anything down and send it to the parents or families of children we work with. We work with. Sometimes they're more formal documents, like legal um, legal documents, like a 504 form, for instance, would be an example of that. <clears throat> um, sometimes there's just a lot of information you need them to know about you, about how you do your job, things like that. Um, that might be like more of a disclosure statement kind of document. Um, there's a range of personalization where you're trying to follow up with interventions at home and they're specific to that child or that family. Um, there are issues that come up that might require a much more personalized um, uh, kind of touch when you're writing them. And there are other things that are more information based like newsletters or describing curriculum in uh, early childhood classrooms for instance. Uh, and there should be a fairly uh, consistent level of communication with progress when you're uh, working with a child who's a, a student so in an early childhood classroom or another type of classroom <clears throat> regular progress reports are pretty important so that the parents are aware of changes in real time in other settings like therapy and things <clears throat> there might be uh, a more reason for documentation's sake to write a formal letter stating progress to the parents. Um, otherwise, you might just meet with them or call them. Documentation is a really important part of the worlds that we that you all will be working in. Um, anytime that there is something that is significant or important or a change or incidents, for instance. Um, those need to be documented and that's as much for their safety it is, as it is for yours um, and keeping up with written accounts of things as they change or things as they happen is, or, or the, is really important. Um, okay so that is it for the lecture portion of this week of us responding appropriately and then some discussion about written communication. Uh, there are three assignments, I believe, for this week, so look on Blackboard for that. Email me with any questions or to uh, clarify, and um, and uh, keep an open line. I keep an open line of communication for anything else related to the class that you might need to know about. Okay.